Hello and welcome to the International Schools Podcast. My name is Dan Taylor. My name is John Licton. Join us twice a month at the International Schools Podcast as we have conversations with international school leaders, educators, and entrepreneurs working and engaging in the world of international schools and education. And finally, just to say a huge thank you to our sponsor, Asa for Education, for making this podcast happen. Now on to the episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. Uh, John, I'm here with my co-host, John Mixon. John, how are you doing? Very good, Dan. Really good. And always nice to be back together and uh, have some conversations uh, with you and our guests. So I'm really looking forward to uh, connecting. We've both been traveling a little bit. The last time we spoke last week, you were in the Alps, weren't you? Of a school ski That's trip. right. Yeah. I've just, I was I've with... just been in Poland, in Wrocław. I just got back home one hour ago. So it's pretty uh, pretty good timing. Excellent. So uh, it's been busy. So, so today is kind of, uh, I was just as we were uh, getting all into the room together today, Dan, and our guests, I was just saying that I'm a bit starstruck because many a few years back, I went to an exhibit in Luxembourg called The Glass Room, which kind of is an interactive exhibit that really shows the impact of your digital footprint and how organizations and companies track your information, your behaviors, and often that's curated for uh, you know, products or consumerism. And in some political settings, that can also be quite dangerous for people to have their information available because there can be political repercussions. Anyway, so I heard about this group called Tactical Technology Collective. I start following them. I use a lot of their materials. And so I'm just really excited to have both uh, members of the technical technology group here. I think, and Dan, we've talked about this a lot, is this idea of digital footprint. And yeah. you, you're very uh, open and kind of easygoing about people, uh, your digital footprint. It doesn't seem, and correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't always seem to be a big issue for you. While for me, I'm obsessed about it, not about my digital footprint, but the idea that we've moved to a society where privacy has really been watered down and we really don't have much say. And am I wrong in, in, in no, your I think, you know, I'm, I think of like my, yeah, I've got my public digital footprint. Obviously I, I have an ed tech company. I'm involved with a lot of schools. So I, I'm, I'm posting on, on LinkedIn and Twitter. So I think I'm quite private about my personal one. I mean, you, John, gave me some good advice, um, when 12 years ago when we first met and you said don't ever write anything in an email or chat that you don't think will be put on the web and uh, and it's, it's actually really good. i mean obviously you know neither of us we're not journalists working in conflict zones you know we don't have confidential or dangerous information typically but it's still very good advice you know because uh, and again we'll get to our guests and i've certainly got some amazing points in this i mean now when so much so much conversation happens in whatsapp groups now i've noticed with all my friends it's moved from kind of facebook chat to whatsapp and you think like some of the things people say now i'm just like guys you know like i can't be part of this conversation i mean nothing particularly bad but just in out of context the things people say you know and i'm very careful about anything i say online in, in in any context no i echo what you're saying and i hate when people on twitter start writing public messages about you or trying to have a conversation i'm like yeah, yeah. email me or call me so you know this whole kind of landscape and narrative of our digital privacy and Shoshana Zuboff's book, Surveillance Capitalism. We know there's a lot going on, but what I've really enjoyed about Tactical Technology Collective, it's just the rich resources and how appropriate they are to support kids and adults. And they're very thoughtful and very provocative, not only in their design, but in their content with activities and PDFs. So, Enough said about that. Louise and Safa, thank you so much for being here. It's a real honor and pleasure. And let's start with Louise. If you could just give us a quick introduction about you as a person, and then we'll come back to the organization and the glass room and, of course, data detox kits. So, Louise. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, um, yeah, for this opportunity to be here. And it's great to hear um, your interactions with the glass room. Um, so I'm Louise. I'm originally from Brazil, but I've been in, in living in Germany for quite some time. And I've been working at Tactical Tech um, at the Glassroom Project for about three years now. And before my, um, I, I focus more on archiving and cultural heritage preservation. Um, 
but also in, you know, looking at the digital space. And I think I gained a more of a critical approach since being at Tactical Tech. But I think these things are, you know, preservation is something that's very important to me. Thank you, Louise. Safa, welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Um, I've also been following you for years on Twitter and uh, seeing all the amazing resources you share, not only by us, but also from others. So thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm Safa. I'm Associate Program Director at Tactical Tech, and I am also leading a couple of projects, the Data Detox Kit and the Digital Inquirer Kit. Um, and I... Um, um, originally, uh, I grew up in the U.S. I'm a U.S.-born Palestinian, and I've been now in Germany for ages. Um, but right. you wouldn't know that hearing my German. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and my background is in adult education. And um, I, too, also, when I joined Tactical Tech uh, about five years ago, was also kind of the, the first time I was able to organize my thoughts. You know, over the years, I had been concerned about social media and privacy and where technology was going, but I didn't have the language for it or a really comprehensive picture. So tactical tech has definitely gotten me there. <laughs> I've yeah. been learning new things every day. So I want to remind our audience, Safa and Louise have been very generous. Go to the show notes. You're going to get all the links and Dan has put tactical tech org up there, but definitely spend some time. Who is tactical technology? Tell us, Louise, you want to kind of give us a, a little overview? Yeah, so maybe I can I can do it in my own words. Um, but I feel like if, I, if we put it really simply, tactical tech aims to demystify technology, doing this through various different projects that look at different perspectives and framings of how technology is shaping our societies today. So we have projects that are more research-based and are looking at um, data and elections. We also have projects focusing on investigative journalism and different um, tactics using open source intelligence. And then we also have other projects, which um, Saf and I focus more on, um, which are looking at like media literacy, education, arts, and using these different formats to um, shape this co these conversations which are, you know, ever changing because the technologies and the way that they're shaping the societies we live, we live in um, continue to change. And who are you funded by, Safa? So w what is this organization? Because you produce a lot of materials. Uh, it must cost quite a lot because they're very engaging. There's great graphics. You translate in multiple different languages. So how are you funded? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, as a nonprofit organization, we are funded through a variety of different sources who we are very grateful to. Um, for example, right now, Louise and I are working on some projects together that are primarily funded through CEDA, the Swedish International Development Agency, as well as the EU, the European Commission. They have um, some funding set aside for digital and media literacy across Europe. Um, so these uh, two funders are, are just... Um, a couple of a handful who fund us. Um, but of course, as you can imagine, because we are in like really interrogating and investigating the, the topics of privacy and data collection, um, we also comment quite a lot about the big five, you know, the GAFAM, Google, Apple, Facebook, um, Amazon, and Microsoft, which means then that it's also not so easy for us um, to find new funding sources because a lot of them are funded by Microsoft or you know any of these big five. So we uh, take funding from sources that align with our values and and our our messaging as well. So sure. fantastic. I, do, is there ever an issue uh, with with EU funding? Obviously, because you, you're talking about governments, are you typically talking about non-European things, or has that ever been an issue with? Because obviously, data privacy, governments are always there's intelligence agencies from every country. Has that has that ever been an issue, or, or, or not? Not what you've done. So far, it hasn't been an issue. I mean, 
I think that the European Commission it has been really gracious in trying to support these initiatives and yep. really, uh, you know, also accepting our, our perspective and supporting our perspective and asking us to speak at conferences with our perspectives. So actually, they've been nothing but supportive, which is okay. great. 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 Mm -hmm. So Safa, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Louise, you have tactical technology, you have the glass room, and you have data, data detox. So is tactical technology the umbrella organization and these are sub projects? And can you maybe talk about those two? And Safa, jump in because I know you're very involved with data detox. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, Tactical Tech would be the organization. Um, and then we have these umbrella projects. So some more research and then some more public engagement projects. And the Glassroom is um, one of the pro is the project I coordinate. And this project, like, as you said, it's um, it, it also aims to demystify technology, but it uses the exhibition format. So you likely in Luxembourg visited um, one of our larger glass rooms that had artworks and these were, you know, very kindly um, supported by Mozilla. And since then, since around 2019, 2020, the main format that goes around um, with the glass room is one that we call the glass room community edition. And this is essentially a glass room exhibition in a box. So the formats we're looking at here are things like posters, digital apps, animations, and different videos. And then along, along with this comes the data detox kit. And these exhibitions, um, for me, one of the, the things that, one of the reasons why they're so important is because um, we design them in a way that they can be scaled. So we design them in a way where um, we can then work with partners to be able to understand how this content is useful to them and add this kind of layer of, you know, engagement and bring it to their audiences. And I think that, you know, if we had tried to run all of these events ourselves, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have succeeded, not only because there's so much territory to cover, but also because we don't know the, the audiences and we don't know their needs. And we also don't, um, you know, each country, each city, each audience has their own specific needs. And so I think one of the nice things about this content and how we design it is to be able to keep it open um, depending on who the audience is. And yeah, maybe I'll hand it over to Safa for the data detox kit. Yeah, sure. Um, maybe just before I get into the data detox, um, it might also be helpful to zoom out a little bit because at Tactical Tech, you know, we have quite a large variety of projects. Um, right now, I think there are like uh, five or six active projects. And, um, you know, Louise and I are typically working um, in these like public intervention, digital media literacy, but we do also have a, a sort of department or, or section which um, does train journalists and investigators. And I really think about the work we do at Tactical Tech. Uh, lately, I've been thinking about it like an apple where, you know, Louise and I are really working on in, in the outside of this apple, um, trying to train the public, educators, librarians, um, at, because we need to protect the core and the seeds of the apple, who, in my mind, are journalists, investigators, reporters, um, you know, uh, whistleblowers, people who are doing this really incredible and important and meaningful work that um, I think, you know, one thing we can all do is to, to try to protect them is to really ask questions of, of the technology that we're using and hold high standards to it and, um, you know, have these conversations. So I'm glad we're having this conversation. Um, yeah, so I, I typically uh, have been heavily involved in the Data Detox Kit and the Digital Inquirer Kit. And so the Data Detox Kit is a series of guides to give people like concrete steps and tips that they can take to feel more in control of their online lives. You know, anywhere from how to control their data, um, how to strengthen their passwords, uh, uh, also the topics of 
online well-being? You know, when do you feel imbalanced or, you know, what is okay for you or not okay for you? This answer varies per individual. Um, and we've recently started also looking into health data and uh, the sort of consequences of technology on climate change and the environment. So we're really expanding our topics all the time. And the Digital Inquirer Kit is an e-learning, which is uh, meant to train anyone on how to do research, basically how to be an investigator of sorts and how to work together on research projects, how, you know, how to find credible information. What does credible even mean? You know, all these, these questions are tackled through the Digital Inquirer Kit. Fantastic. Um that's so great. tell us, what, oh, go ahead, Dan. So, you know, I, I was fascinated because I'm, I'm interested in, in the journalist thing. I'm actually a member of, I don't know if you've heard of the Frontline Club in London. It's, um, it's an organization for, for conflict journalists, most of it. Actually, if it's a physical club, it's a place I stay in London, but they do a lot of work with, with conflict journalists. And I, I think that, I think um, they do something similar to your security in the box. And I want to ask you about that because that's a really interesting to me as a, someone who's into cybersecurity. So obviously for conflict journalists, you know, um, the risk of of hacking and, and 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 you know government actors or other people getting access to their communications and 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 doxing them is, is and then you know taking action against them is a real thing. What could you talk a bit about security in the box? Because that it looks like a really interesting initiative to me. Yeah, sure. Should I take this? Yeah, on sure. Maybe? Okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So security in the box is one of our. Um, I don't even know how to put into words how important it's been for our organization. It was really like a key milestone project when we look back at our past 20 years. You know, this year is our 20 year anniversary and we're looking back and reflecting a lot. And security in, in a box, um, uh, just in the last couple of years, we've handed it over to an organization who co-developed it with us called Frontline Defenders. So right yep. now it is it is fully being updated and maintained by them. They're doing a great job. That's right. I think the Frontline Club, I think it was your actually your... Um... Your uh, website that they featured, I remember the Frontline Defenders. I remember hearing that name, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. we've had really, uh, we've been lucky to have really great collaborators in the past, and they're definitely one of them. But yeah, Security in a Box, it's, it's a resource that um, is both a printed book as well as an, a website, which gives uh, steps that people can take, for example, to set up VPNs, you know, what is encryption, how to set up encryption, um, really looking at different tools, you know, secure private access tools, uh, like different chats and um, uh, email servers, things like that, basically, uh, just to give people a lot of ideas of um, what kinds of tools exist online or platforms or software that exist online that are safe and privacy centric. And this resource has um, been very meaningful. Um, it's been a part of, you know, all of our trainings, but it's also been an inspiration to all of the work that Louise and I are doing and uh, that our colleagues are doing because the research and development that took place in order to make security in a box uh, ha has basically informed other resources that we've created as like adaptions of that or inspiration from that. It's, it's a highly recommended. It's interesting on the cybersecurity front because I'm I, I, like the more you read about it, the more like the more you get paranoid. I think. I mean, I don't know if you, <laughs> you, you guys and John have you heard of something called Team Jorge, J O R G E. I only learned about no, these I guys last month. T just look it up on Wikipedia, Team J O R G, and it's an Israeli outfit, and they've kind of got underground a little bit now, but they were openly, openly advertising services. You could hack someone's phone. It, it was, the prices were quite reasonable, I thought. It was like $10,000 or something. But they, were, they had a service for interfering in elections. It was about $4 million. And, they, and it was- Oh, I did they, read about that. They've yes, done this for various African that. governments. They've literally, they've literally, you know, it's like documented, you know, how they did that. And you think like, so even if you take all your basic actions of, of using Tor, of using Telegram, maybe you get an anonymous phone, you know, you, 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 you buy it with cash, you do all these things. It's still like, it, it's terrifying what's actually out there. And for, for a committed state actor, or even this is a private organization, like committed private organization, what, what they can get access to. And do you guys find that whatever you do, it, it's still, you know, impossible to, to stop people getting hacked? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious also to hear from Louise too. But, you know, in my perspective, I really think about this topic as, you know, 
first of all, like who, who are we seeking privacy from? Right. Because there are lots of different potential, like bad actors, quote unquote, depending on our circumstance, where we live, what our job is, what our identity is. Um, And I think in, at least in, in my situation, there are some of those actors who I can take steps to protect myself against and some actors who I cannot for whatever reason, um, either because it's just so beyond me, so big or, or whatnot. Um, for example, like hackers like these, for example, data brokers, um, it, it can feel really hopeless at times. But I just want to say that when I think about online privacy and data, data traces, I really think about it also like I, I think about my, my footprint in climate change, where yes, there is a way to be perfect, right? But actually, maybe what we're looking for is not perfectionism, but really just day to day to take the small steps. Yep. So I think it really depends on the profile, you know, for example, someone, um, an, an investigator living in in a country where the government really oppresses investigators i think their situation is going to look a lot different than someone like me living in uh a germany you know so i, I yeah. think it, it really depends on where people are living their their level of concern but of course it really varies per person i've I think these conversations can go in circles but they can also go in really productive places you know like for example, learning that VPNs are actually considered illegal or restricted in some countries. So actually, you know, maybe it makes sense for some individuals who are in vulnerable groups to continue using Google or, you know, so they don't go, so they can go undetected or under the radar for a bit longer. Um, So these are just some messy thoughts that I have about it. Mm-hmm. Dan, I think it's interesting you bringing that up because now I remember the Guardian did a story is that how much there's an industry for that. And oh, okay, the huge, Israeli company was definitely working with governments, but you can go on tour and get somebody to hack your grandmother's bank account if you needed to, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's this, this, it's, there's like this marketplace out there. And, and, and I think tied to this is also a lot of this misinformation. And Louise, one of the glass rooms that you did is about misinformation where you're really, you know, we have this information, but there's so much misinformation out there and how uh, to kind of navigate that. Can you talk a bit about this idea of misinformation and what you guys did with your glass room on that? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah. And, you know, tying back a little bit to what was just being said before, I think that, you know, independent if if we are investigative journalists or human rights defenders or, you know, people who, you know, we might think have, have something to hide or something to conceal, I do think that everyone does have a reason to care. Um, and also something that's often, you know, relayed and, and said, and I first heard this at a digital security training that Safa organized, is that risk is often inherited or risk is inherited. And so, even if we're not in that position, we might be emailing or connected to in different ways people who are. And so it's our job as well to, to take certain steps to be more careful so that you know we can protect this whole web. Um, and I think that the misinformation edition, so as John mentioned, this, this is um, our latest community edition. It's um, it was first released in 2020 and it's, it was updated and new, you know, posters were released, but essentially this is not talking about misinformation as the problem. It's talking about misinformation as a sim- symptom of something much, much larger, which, you know, we don't really have a name for it, but we could call it the influence industry. It's like a very complex um, network of actors and tactics and political. The influence industrial complex. (laughs) The influence industrial complex. (laughs) Yeah. And so, yeah, so misinformation or the, you know, the infodemic is is just one of the symptoms of this um, kind of industry. It's also an industry that, you know, um, lives off our attention and our attention, attention span. So something that um, we talk a lot about is 
you know, putting down your phone, sometimes it's really not easy. But what are the different design, design tricks, different patterns, different like sounds and vibrations that make it really hard to, to put it down? And these are all things that are building off of our psychological and like also marketing principles. And so a lot of the t a lot of times, a lot of um, things are very intentional, but it's a little bit hard to see through that. So when we talk about misinformation, we're not just talking about like debunking or verification, but rather we're trying to look at like the whole ecosystem that surrounds um, the tech we use and then and how that how it's very hard to not only put our phones down, but also we talk about credible information through deep fakes. And so deep fake technology, um, which might be, you know, um, you could you could either have deep fake which are very very complex and have to be made in a studio but you could also have things like cheap cheap fakes which can be made with very um simple you know design tools and so you could alter a, a photo or you can slow down a video to kind of give a create an an image or create an an idea a concept and so oftentimes it's only that little seed being planted that can kind of turn into something much larger. And so by creating these ex exhibits or kits or articles, we're just trying to also plant a little seed that hopefully people will take an interest in, in some of these things and then start researching and start to, you know, see, see them differently. So mm -hmm. when you, you know, when you're trying to, look at your screen time and you're getting frustrated that, you know, you're spending way too much time on social media. It's also trying to understand what, what, what are some of the things that keep you hooked um, and keep you kind of engaged. Um, I think all of these problems, they're very human and there's never like a right or wrong answer. You know, there's never like a, a list of things that we could give to say, this is the amount of time or these are the apps you should use. At the end of the day, it's one understanding that ecosystem and second, maybe being equipped with the right principles, like guiding principles on how to select tech or, you know, how to maybe think about these things. Yeah, fascinating. And that's one thing you do is actually you talk about when you buy a new phone, you have a whole kind of course. What is the thing you want to do when you buy a brand new phone? What are some things that you can set up? It's almost, I think there was even one about the defaults, avoiding the defaults. You know, because defaults are very interesting because most people don't know about a default. You know, when they sign a, a document or, you know, they opt in and now you have to opt out. And that changes often. You know, you always get these updates. I just got one from Zoom. So I actually decided to read it. There's a lot in there they're changing that I had no idea. And apparently they've been telling me for a while and I just didn't take the time. And it really took me a good 90 minutes and then cross research. And I'm just thinking if I had to do that for everything that I approve, and that's just untenable. So I think your point, Louise, is so important is what seeds can we plant for people to be more mindful and have those dispositions to not be cynical, but just to understand there's a game being played. And I think, Dan, you just mentioned it, the influence, what was the IDS, the influence development? Uh, uh, industrial comfort. I just, I just invented that. It wasn't. It's not a real thing. I just. I, <laughs> but I yeah. like it. I like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But I think you know, Dan. When you think of your work, and you're working, you know, a lot with Google, and there's definitely that influence. We all are. You know, schools yeah. are tied to platforms. You're sure. either in the Microsoft world or the Google world. Those are the two worlds that most international schools live in. Uh, and that immediately puts you into a basket, and that information however much is said not to be used, you are kind of influenced by that. What are, in your work, uh, Safa, when you work with adult education and kids education, are you, are you physically going to locations or is it really propagating through the website and then social media? Yeah, well, I mean, especially in the last few years, there hasn't been very much travel. Only recently we yeah. started traveling again to conferences, for example. But I think, you know, as Louise mentioned earlier, we try to look at our approach in a very, very, very scalable model. So, you know, sure, I could travel around to schools, but that wouldn't be quite as helpful if 
than if I were to lead a session with 25 other educators, like a training of trainers. And actually that is a model that we partake in, that we organize and do regularly and that we are continuing to do. Um, for example, uh, you know, right now we are developing some new resources. So next year we're going to check in with some of our old partners and, uh, do another training of trainers of those new resources. You know, this is how you can have conversations on certain topics. And here are some resources you could use about those topics. Um, and, you know, I think too, as you mentioned about how there are, really strong players in the educational realm in schools like Google. Um, you know, just one thing that I would recommend to educators, because I understand it's not so easy to flip the system upside down and change everything, especially when you're already at a, at a minus, at a negative with time and capacity. But I would just, um, you know, put out there to educators that even using Google tools or the tools of other big corporations, you can still interrogate and ask questions and, and challenge and analyze with your students what those companies are doing, what other companies they've acquired, what other fields they're in. Sure. Um, and I mentioned that, like, I, I don't just want to pick on Google, of course, there are many big organizations or big companies um, like this, but I just mentioned Google because actually in the glass room, there's been a lot of work looking into the acquisitions of some of these big five. For okay. example, the acquisitions of Google, what, what other companies do Alphabet own? And uh, I think some of them are, are kind of surprising, at least they were for me. Um, companies in biometrics, companies in healthcare, pharmaceuticals, also companies in warfare. Um, yeah. So I think it's, it, I, I could see this as a really uh, interesting way for educators to, uh, you know, flip the topic on its head to say, okay, well, we have to use these Google tools for whatever reason, if you have to, for time, for, um, you know, requirements by the state, whatever. But let's still talk about these companies, you know, um, yeah. what do we feel? Like? What does the future want? You know, what, what the future wants? Um, are young people okay with this? Do they want a different future? Um, yeah. And, and I wonder, Louise, if you want to add to that too. Yeah, I, I think one thing that comes to mind is how, um, you know, even within tactical tech, we have the option if we'd like to use proprietary um software like so not open source um you know and just as an example we we could use vimeo or we could use youtube because we might reach more people through those platforms and so it's it is a decision but we also have for example a peer tube which is an open source um platform which isn't c collecting any data and you know so we, we always will have that open source um free option also because of our ethos of where we stand, but it doesn't mean that we completely reject, you know, Facebook and technical tech still is on Facebook or on Instagram because we can also reach people there and be able to spread these ideas and spread resources. Um, so I think it's more of like uh, separating than the, how critical you want to be about it and understand uh, from like the, you know, being able to find people or like Safa said, maybe you have very, a lot of time constraints and that's what's on offer. Um, so being able to work between the two. Yeah. One thing I just, just will just add about Google, just, just for the sake of completeness is that Google workspace for education uh, doesn't have any ads or tracking. They keep that very separate. Obviously Google, Google is an advertising company, Alphabet, that's, that's with income, but Google workspace has a different terms of service and there is just, there is no advertising or, or tracking within workspace for education but obviously within why do google of course serving ads is how they how they make their money so safa and louise like you know dan and i uh i think it's about four or five, maybe two months ago when chat gpt3 came in we jumped onto a call with three it directors and you know now we're at chat gpt4 i was at the live stream last night uh, how is that shifting your own work? Because you're talking about privacy and this idea of misinformation and influencers. And this things are changing really fast. And what are you noticing in your time? You've been together there in the organization eight years. What are some things that are really kind of 
raising your eyebrows and saying, wow, we need to engage with this. Are there a couple things that really stick out that maybe our audience might want to be mindful of? Yeah, I mean, maybe just to answer off the top of my head, I, I so this is very much um, from my own vantage point, not necessarily on behalf of Tactical Tech, but from my own vantage point, even though the technologies keep evolving, I find that I come back to the same basic concerns, you know, um, data collection uh, in, in a way that we are not understanding or consenting to. Um, also, the, the application of technologies, for example, in um, surveillance and profiling, in um, misleading. And for me, actually, um, you know, because I, I am very critical of technology, but I'm not necessarily a super techie person. So from my vantage point, it, it feels very similar in a sense that the technology has been racing forward for years, actually, you know, for example, with um, with algorithms, with deep fakes. So now they are, you know, just much more difficult to analyze and, you know, to visually find clues of what makes a deep fake because they're so realistic looking. But actually, I think the, the approach that we've been taking all along is not how to, you know, see a deep fake with your naked eye, but rather what questions you can ask. If you see a video that looks too good to be true or that scares you or surprises you, maybe just taking stock of your own emotional response and thinking, ah, okay, is, you know, is there a reason I'm, I'm reacting to this? Could it be that it has been created in one way or another, either a deep fake or cheap fake to, to get me to share it, to get me to, to scare my friends too, or to get me yeah. to support a certain cause, for example, anti-immigration or, or something like that. So for me, I, I still feel like it's so similar in that way. I got That's a really question. interesting observation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, misinformation is fascinating to me. I was watching a, a Glenn Greenwald video of him, and I know he's a very polarizing character. I, I don't agree with all his things. I was a big fan of, you know, the Edward Snowden in the early days, but he was, um, he's got a big thing about misinformation experts, and it's, it's kind of one of his like topics. You know, he was talking about it like, there's, in his opinion, like there's no such thing as a misinformation expert. I mean, people, all four of us have an agenda. You know, everyone does as much as we try to be even-handed. Everyone, everyone does, and usually people who put themselves up as misinformation experts. I mean, it's not like you go to it's not like you go to journalism school to study to be. A, and he was, and, and it made me think. Yeah, I'm, and I want to get your opinions if you agree or disagree. But like, I, I kind of agree with him in the sense that like, it, it isn't. I don't think anyone is a misinformation expert. And, and the problem is, who do you trust then? Because there's no like, if if something's misinformation. The person who te who's telling you it is might not be telling you the truth. You know, that's what I find. I'm curious what you think about that. Louise, thoughts? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I agree with that. I think misinformation also is not necessarily a thing. It's almost a phenomenon, you know, like yeah. a cultural, social, political phenomenon that um, we keep seeing different sides of it. Um, and, you know, we, you could have situations like, you know, health or like we saw during the pandemic, health misinformation or um, misinformation related to elections. And these things can be really, really devastating and the, the kind of impact that they have. Um, so yeah, I don't think anyone is um, a misinformation like expert per se. I do think though that like sometimes understanding the, so, if you look at mis a, a piece of misinformation and then the, the context in which it has spread, this is a very useful way to understand like it's the reason why it spreads in a way. So how does it play on specific fears yeah. or doubts um, that are actually already there? Right. Yeah. So and the, the algorithm and all these platforms feeds you more of the same and you can go down a horrendous rabbit hole. You watch one video and then you just go. <laughs> you <know. laughs> exactly. Yeah. So then you can also, like you said, you can look at the, the actual algorithms or what's happening behind the screen. And then I'll go even further in saying that these massive companies like Twitter or like Facebook, who have huge, huge numbers of people engaging on that platform, you know, they also have responsibility of having content moderation teams and legal teams, um, because that, that also plays a huge role in how misinformation is spread. So we yeah. can look at, for example, how the level of misinformation spread 
for example, on um, communities who like communities living in the States that speak a, a foreign language is much higher because the content moderation teams are not there necessarily to deal with um, those pieces of information. So as much as we can look at this as being a technical, um, you know, very kind of mystical in a way with the algorithm, mm -hmm. it is also a human, um, it's also a very human uh, role that needs to be played. Definitely. Yeah, Twitter did something recently that um, obviously I won't get into the whole Elon Musk saga, but something I really liked is like now they, um, when put, people post content, it's often got some belief. It's saying this, you know, this may not be true. Here's a link to some primary sources. I, I only saw this for the first time a couple of weeks ago, but it, it was interesting that it looked like they were at least trying to, you know, label certain certain things. Absolutely. And it's interesting. I tried some of that in chat GPT-3 and it said it was inappropriate and it would not have a response because that's not what chat GPT is about. Right. Yeah. Safa, you were going to uh, jump in. Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, I was just going to mention that um, also on, on social media, you know, to give credit where it's due there, there has been, um, I think it was already at the start of the pandemic, quite a lot of efforts to um, tackle misinformation. For example, now you can report certain posts as being misinformation or spreading misinformation. And so the, the um, website will look into it, their teams will look into it. Um, but, you know, as Louise said, then it goes to a content moderation team and, and you know, or an algorithm which has been built by people with yeah. certain perspectives. And so, you know, we still definitely see, for example, some journalists in certain parts of the world are are you know getting their accounts suspended because they are you know being accused of spreading misinformation when actually it isn't so i think the question of credibility is really important and that's something that i think educators could really tackle in the classroom is trying to get their classes to sit down and try and define what makes credibility what does credibility mean? Who is a credible source um, in terms of the principles? And, you know, I found that for the Digital Inquirer kit, I was working with a really great team of um, three other co-writers who specialize in digital security and investigation. And we tried to define what, what makes a credible resource. And really it took us ages to pinpoint a few key words. Um, but we, and, you know, in parts of this uh, exploration, we went around in circles. Well, credibility means that you can trust them. What does trust mean? And, you know, like it's, it, it's just, it can be messy, but these conversations can also be very helpful. I think especially for, um, well, also for young people, truly for actually any age group to explore that question for themselves, you know, how, how would you explain credibility to someone else? And um, what would make you lose that kind of trust of that new source? So, and I think your point's an important one, because a lot of teachers struggle with it, because they often don't have the skills and the toolkits to have those conversations. Because Often it requires some research and knowing certain resources and certain strategies. So I think this credibility thing is really important, especially with deep fakes, uh, because I think you brought up a really important point. You might not be able to distinguish the deep fake. I don't know if everybody knows what a deep fake is. Basically, it's a video or an image where it's doctored up or redesigned to push a different story than maybe the person in the picture would ever do. Uh, and so, but I think, you know, you brought up the point, it, maybe we can't do the deep fakes, but we can definitely learn what are the questions we ask to understand if that's credible or not, even though if it's a deep fake or not. So I'm going to be provocative. Where do you get your information as an organization? So, you know, you're going out and you talked about a digital security group and the frontier development. So how are you navigating that yourself? Because you're definitely poking around in areas where maybe people don't want you poking around. <laughs> well, maybe. So it's difficult to answer that question organizationally. Um, because so at our organization, we actually have, uh, you know, people from all over the world, from many different backgrounds and, and perspectives as well. So 
where we do have some chat rooms where we're sharing news stories that are really relevant to our work. Um, and they're from a variety of sources. And actually, that's a tip that we suggest to people to seek your news sources from a variety of, of sources. If you're only going, for example, um, like, let's just pick on the BBC for a second. I typically consider them a very credible news source, but there are some times where they're, they're reporting, you know, for example, with my cultural background, where I find it to be a bit questionable or clearly like certain political leaning. Um, so then I just go to another, another news source and, and look at it there and, and try to compare. And again, going back to this term, interrogate, interrogating those sources, comparing them, kind of debating them in my head, especially if they're really important to me. Um, you know, hopefully it never happens again. But for example, if there is another pandemic we have to deal with, this is a really great way to approach news sources. One of them is telling you to do this. Let's check out another one. Are they saying the same things or yeah. are they telling me something totally different? You know, does it sound completely different than what I'd expect? Maybe then I need to look for a third source, you know? Um, so you don't have to do it, I think, day to day with every single topic. But I think with some of these things that surprise you, scare you, um, you know, uh, make you nervous or anxious, that's a really a good strategy. It's funny, like the BBC, I mean, obviously I'm British where the BBC is an institution, but I, I actually disagree with you. I, I don't think the BBC has any credibility at all. I mean, I, that's too strong a term. I don't think it has much. I mean, I used to, <laughs> that's it's very, very like, strong. Culturally, if you take my parents, and even when I was young, like the BBC, you know, there was three news channels. There was the BBC, there was ITV, Channel 4, BBC 1 and 2, it's four channels. And um, the BBC was the source of truth. Like my parents would watch the BBC, and that was absolutely what was happening in the world. And when I look at the BBC now is... Um, you know, there's a, what's this, what's this, there's a psychological term where, like, you, you watch something on TV or you read about it in the newspaper and you believe it's true, but then they, um, sorry, you, you, you watch, you, you look you, you look at a topic on the BBC and you know about it. You, you know deeply about this topic, right? And you always think, that's just rubbish. They've got everything, everything wrong. But then they go into the next topic you don't know about and you think, oh, that's true. That must be true, you know? But you just watch the topic where you know about it and you know it's not true what they're saying. So I'm, I'm very skeptical of, uh, of the BBC. I think they're, you know, often parroting the opinion of, of the British government, which, you know, that's where they get a lot of their funding. But uh, yeah, anyway, just a general point. I'm curious what you think about that. Both Louise, of you. What do you think about this kind of echo chamber? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, usually I, I, I've caught myself, like last year, I caught myself even spreading some misinformation because yeah. a few, you know, it was all around the elections in Brazil, a time when, you know, I should have seen the signs as well. Election, especially when it was so close um, yeah. and there was a second term, you know, there's just a lot of like information coming at you from all different sides. And it's, I found myself during that period being feeling very frustrated, feeling very stressed. And I should have taken that as a sign to maybe um, step not even like be more critical just step step away a little bit because oftentimes you know it is very psychological like you know imagine you're 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 trying to find information about something and it's affecting um your well-being it's affecting um kind of your emotions and so when you come across a piece of information you might just take it in because of the emotional state you're in rather you know whereas if you were at a calmer emotional state that you might have like tried to verify and this yeah. actually was a piece of information that was just being shared in many different places and i caught myself just being outraged by it and so sharing it even with a few colleagues and late only later on when you know people all expressed the same amount of shock that i kind of thought you know information sometimes information okay so two things it's um, information is put out there to kind of create the sense of shock. So we often have that with things like clickbaits. Yeah. And two, we often like to take on information that confirms our um, our views, that like to confirm the views we already have, right? Yeah. And so sometimes it's really hard to stop yourself um, from allowing this kind of confirmation. But it's important sometimes, especially when you see these different triggers, um, right in your emotions or in others that that's a, a kind of um, a sign to kind of step back um, and then also I think just realizing the 
the emotion the the our emotional state because even though we are online and even though it feels like a social space it's often a space where we're getting many many you know notifications and it's a whole little world this this um screen and so i think stepping back sometimes and just taking a breath um is really important just so that we can um yeah have a clear mind to be able to understand what's going on Louise, you're, it's very interesting, this anecdote where you said there was something that you read or in some social media context, and then you spread it out and it was shock value and you had a reaction. And I think that happens to everybody. I don't think there's anybody in this room or in our audience that has not read something on Facebook and had a gut reaction. And then later you're like, wow, how did I fall for that? That is definitely, you know, and I think it's just the, the sophistication and the way the algorithms have really become very sophisticated to pull those emotional uh, triggers and those emotional cords. And I think that's something that, you know, is something that we have to almost train ourselves because emotions are very primeval. They're gut, you know, you react, you do. And sometimes you have to be able to kind of stop yourself at the trigger point and say, hold on, I'm getting emotional on this news story. I better ch chill out and pull away and then reevaluate. And I think that is something that uh, is definitely something that we should be teaching kids, you know, kind of this emotional well balance and the triggers. I remember, Dan, I think it was during COVID, you said you stopped watching the news or listening to the news. Still have. Right? I, I've stopped watching the news since COVID. I still don't. Um, I've deleted the Twitter app off my phone as well. I, uh, I, the only posting to Twitter is automatically through LinkedIn. I don't, I don't even log on. Yeah, I did. I just found it depressing. And, uh, I still, I mean, I, I get my, it's amazing how much news and things you get from just talking to people. And then, you know, now and again, I'll, I'll investigate and I'll, I'll look at things on the web, but I don't watch any news on TV. I never go to any, any, any news website. Yeah. Given up completely. I, I'm yeah. And that's good. interesting. And you're surviving. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still alive. <laughs> I, and I'm very similar to you, actually. And, and it's funny because um, especially with watching news on TV, I've really, really cut it out and only seek news sources online from, you know, for example, Reuters or other yeah. other organizations that I respect. Um, but it's funny then if I visit someone and, and the TV's on, the news is on, it strikes me how sensationalist it is, how triggering it yeah, is, exactly, or yeah. how repetitive also it is. Um, I, I think you don't really notice it until you step away for some time. Exactly, yeah. exactly right. And you know, when you step away, and like, for example, I was in, I was in a hotel in Poland and, I, you know, CNN was on in, in, a, in a breakfast place. And you just, and it looks so biased when you when you when you haven't when you because when you watch it all the time it just becomes oh that's just normal you know and and you really see the the, the angle um when, when, when you when you're not exposed to it every day uh, that's a yeah, really good I, point oh sorry uh, i yeah. even had a tip about about um how we take in the news because oftentimes if we're watching you know the the news you know the i don't know 8 p.m news um and we're getting fed these little pieces of information we're not really getting the whole context so even I've started yep. just um, subscribing to some new, I don't want to like promote them here, but I think like the New Yorker is really great because it has such deep, you know, I, I could, I did a day I listened to like a 90 minute, um, you know, deep sort of article explaining um, one sort of perspective on something much more complex. And oftentimes that that's much more rewarding, also, but also maybe a little bit tough to get used to in terms of your attention span. Yeah. But to really get an understanding of, um, you know, one situation in the world, um, rather than feeling that you have to consume the sort of more sensationalist um, media. Yeah. There's a great uh, research being done on skim reading. Uh, she's Her name's Patricia Greenfield. She's a UCLA psychologist. And she talks about skim reading. And if you look at your phone and the way the BBC, The Guardian, whatever, Le Monde or whatever paper you're, the Daily Chinese News, whatever it is, it's designed in a way that you get the title. Usually image has a lot of real estate space. And then there's a tagline. And what she and her 
extensive research, what she's seeing is that we scroll and hit the, we don't go into the article, but we're reading a lot of taglines. Yeah. And what they're noticing with people that do that a lot, they learn certain capabilities to do critical thinking and deep reading. Deep reading is when you open a book and you read chapter after chapter and you're, you know, no, there are no kind of, uh, distractions and things. And it's really interesting because I think what uh, you're bringing up, Louise, is, is this idea of what are we doing to make sure we're more uh, deliberate and really digging into the article. One thing that I've done, and it costs more than the digital version, I buy the print version now because I find with the print version, I actually sit down for an hour and a half and read it. I read The Guardian every morning. I don't read any articles. I just go through the headlines yeah. and, and I literally have to like force myself on my phone, but I like the economist. So I get the printed version of the economist and I sit down. I, so I've noticed that this, the way the design is and the intentionality of that really makes it difficult to read deeply with these things. And I think both of you with the news and the sensationalism that you brought up really amplify this fact. Absolutely. And, and yeah, I actually been. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sophie. Sorry. Uh, just just to, to poke in a note about um, other sort of independent journalist sources that are really great out there, for example, like globalvoices.org. Um, there, there are also a few others like that as well, where they not only employ a really diverse group of people to write about uh, about topics from all around the world. So I'm, I'm learning about things I didn't even you know, that doesn't even come into mainstream news sources. Um, but because it's so diverse as well, it's, um, yeah, I just, I find it very, very enlightening and interesting. And I approach it then more as opinion type pieces in, in that case, which actually, you know, anything written by any author can be argued to be biased. Um, and so at least this way, I'm, I'm already approaching it as like, oh, okay, that's a really interesting perspective from this particular author. But sorry, so Louise, global go ahead. voices, uh, globalvoices.org. I just popped on there. That looks really interesting. Louise, you were also going to add. Oh, yeah. I was just going to add a, an, an app that I had come across that's called Informed. Um, and I think the interesting thing with this, and I, I don't know about their payment plans, but they basically um, look at different, you know, big topics. So pandemic might be a topic. Um you know, climate might be a topic. So either situations of things happening, events, or like bigger topics, whether it's migration or, and then they do a curated list of articles that have come out that week from very credible, large, um, you know, publishers. And so you can get a kind of a sense if you're mostly just giving headlines of what those kind of topics and what what are they touching on and then links to those. So it's more of a curation because oftentimes it's, it's, it's just having like the, you know, the different perspectives, but all in one place. Excellent. So globalavoice.org and then informed is yeah. the app. And uh, we'll definitely put that on the show notes. I'm just mindful of time. And it's so fascinating uh, to talk to you both, but uh, we're going to have to wrap up here. Again, I just want to thank you, and it's Tactical Tech Org. There's the Glassroom Exhibit and Data Detox. Just any parting thoughts, Safa and Louise, to the audience. So we have international, international educators and leaders. Just something that you might, you know, a message that you maybe share with your audiences, something that, you know, looking at the future and the, the next school year ahead. Yeah, um, if, if it's okay for me to jump right in. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having us. And uh, I think also for any educators out there, you know, if you feel nervous to talk about any of these topics because you're not an expert, just know that I too am, was not an expert when I became interested in, in this, you know, world of, of digital plus human rights. And I think anyone can talk about these topics because actually in many cases, there may not really be a clear answer. It's maybe more of an ethical conversation or philosophical question. And I, um, so I really encourage you to just dive in 
And um, if you don't know the answer to something, you know, just ask your students to look them up. <laughs> you know, ask your students to help do some verification of some topics or um, ask them what the future wants. Excellent. Louise. Yeah, no, definitely. I think I want to echo what Safa's saying. Um, I remember when I started facilitating workshops, I was really nervous. Um, but it, you know, simply saying I'm not an expert as a disclaimer. And that's something that I, I think I would just never say because it's hard to be an expert in anything, especially related to technology and um, yeah. this digital environment we live in. So I would echo that and just echo that you, there's always somewhere you can start. So you can start by checking out one of the online exhibitions or reading through a data detox kit and following the steps. It's, it's how I started when I joined Tactical Tech and that knowledge kind of builds. And um, one thing that I really like about the Digital Inquirers Kit, which is one of the projects that Safa leads, is that you know you, we can think about investigation and about like this curiosity that we have more as a mindset rather than a specific concrete step. So if we think about everything that we, we spoke about today more as a mindset, it's, it's easier to not put so much pressure on, you know, where you want to be or how much information do you want to have, but just as like the kind of things that you want to nurture um, as a person. Thank you. Dan, any thoughts? No, it was fascinating, Chuck. I've, I've just looked up, you, you know, the psychological term for when you read about an article, you know, about and it's not true. Then you read about the next one. It's called Noel's Law of Media Accuracy. K-N-O-D-Y-L. Oh, cool. Noel's Law. Yeah, I, I just couldn't remember the name of it. Yeah. <laughs> no, that is really, really interesting. I've got one quick question. Who, who did your website? I love your website. It's a great design. Oh, amazing. It was actually done in-house, um, oh, okay. as far as That's I know. Fantastic. Yeah, we have a really great uh, small little team of developers and a right. designer. Yeah. How awesome. many are you all together at Tactical Tech? I mean, like in, in the company or organization, sorry? I think we're about 25 people. Okay. Oh, so that's quite, you have, yeah, but that's still, that's quite deep. You can have developers and a lot of other projects. Anyway, I just want to remind our audience that the Safa and Louise from tacticaltech.org and do go to the show notes. They've been very generous and uh, don't hesitate to go to their website. You're going to find a lot of great resources. And I think Safa and Louise both were saying you might not be an expert, but none of us are experts. And I really like that uh, term and we just have to start somewhere. Uh, I Great. think it's just the eagerness to be inquisitive. Thank you so much for being on uh, the International School Podcast, both of you. Thank you, Thank you so much.